So we are in uh, 2 Corinthians, and we're in chapter 6. And so I want to share with you uh, a bit about going in deeper into Paul's resume, okay? He wonderfully is telling us, hey, I've been through this, but God, I've been through this, but God, I've been through this, but God. You guys ever been there? Been through this, but God, right? Absolutely. David in most of his Psalms is like, oh, he's abandoned me in this, and I feel this, this, and then all of a sudden it's like, da 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 but God, right? And there he is, and there he is. And so uh, Paul was sharing that. And last week we learned about the responsibility of the great offer that God is offering us. That look, we're workers together with him, right? We're workers together with him. We're his ambassador and we work together with him uh, for such a time as this. And um, I had given you an illustration about how, you know, we work together, how Brian would uh, mow the lawn and little Becca would follow with her little fake lawnmower and, and think that she's doing it so wonderfully, right? And meanwhile, Dad's doing the heavy, right? And that's how we work. We join him in what he's doing. We don't tell God, hey, I'm doing this, now bless it, right? We join him in what he is doing. We're yoked together with him. So we are workers together with him and we are his ambassador. And then, so we report to the King of Kings. It's not our agenda, right? Not our agenda. It's his agenda. It's his agenda. And so um, he, we got to the point where he said, look, I want you to walk this way. So God's grace won't be in vain. Don't, don't walk, you know, don't receive God's grace in vain. You've received God's grace because you're a believer, right? You have to receive his grace. You're already a believer, but don't receive it in vain. Don't receive it like it's empty, right? Uh, don't, don't fail to walk in grace that you're given, undeserved favor, and then to give that grace freely to those around you right? We've been giving grace upon grace upon grace to give graciously to one another. And so I think, I think many people, you know, as we're workers with Jesus and we're standing in his lavish grace, I, the question that I asked you is that, you know, we struggle at some point, like, well, is God supposed to do this or am I supposed to do this in working with him? And the answer is what? Yes, the answer is yes, right, to both, right? Is God doing this? Yes. Are you doing this? Yes. The answer is yes, okay? And so God does it. Um, we do it, joining him. We trust him. We rely on him. Then we get to work, right? And we work as hard as we can. He does all the increase. How great is that? You guys aren't happy enough again. You're not happy enough. How great is that? All right, all right, much, much better. Okay, now, I... Um, I ended with a six, I think it was three, where he talks about, look at now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. His grace is available now and now and now and now. And so now is the day of salvation, okay? It's not going to last forever. As believers, we are to be consumed with ease of life, okay? With comfort of life, with self-focus of life. We are to what? We're to get busy. We're to get busy and work together with Jesus, okay? Because there, there isn't a better time, right? There isn't a better time than right now to be working together with Jesus, right? I mean, light pushes back darkness, right? And how great is it that we're working together with him to push back darkness? So he said, look, at, I don't want to give any offense. I don't want to give anybody any cause for stumbling, Okay, and so we want to live above the line, and I don't want to give anybody offense. So he said, look, at, I want to become all things to everybody so that some might be saved. It doesn't mean he changes the story. It's still the same old, old story that Jesus says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through me. But it's for everyone. And so he wanted to be everything to everybody. So culturally, he would be like with the Greeks, or culturally, he would be with the Jews, or culturally... But he wouldn't change the truth. He would just change the style of how he's sharing with them. See, that's how we're supposed to do that. That's how we're supposed to do that. So then he goes into and he talks about how he is blameless. Um, actually, he talks about his resume, his credentials as being this blameless minister for Christ. So let's look at that one more time. We're going to read 4 through 10 of chapter 6.
Let's start at three. We put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, hardships, and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments, riots, hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love, in truthful speech, and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as impostors, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and open wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange, I speak as to my children, open wide your hearts also. Now let's pray before we dig in again. Lord Jesus, thank you that your word speaks and we can listen. And Lord, we thank you that your word is living uh, and that um, you want to speak to us now. Not when we get home or not try to ruminate it or try to excuse it or this is, but you want to speak to us now. And so, Holy Spirit, I'm asking that you speak in general and in through me and specifically to what each woman needs right now. Right now. And that they would respond to you. Because we're responding to a life changer. So thank you, Jesus, for reconciling us back to your Father. Thank you for uh, giving us the Holy Spirit, and he is our power. And so, Lord, we ask that you would speak because we are listening. And everybody said? Amen. Bigger, bigger. Everybody said? Okay, much better, much better. Okay, now, he gave us his credentials, as I talked last week um, about this, as a minister, okay? And he says, look at in all things, we commend ourselves, and I want to be able to share with you that, you know, this is my resume to the Corinthian Christians, and he was, com excuse me, he was commending himself before them. If you remember, they never commended him. So he would remind them, this is what God is doing in and through, no matter what, no matter these hardships, okay? And what was the first qualification? Endurance, right? The first qualification was patience. It was endurance. Remember, it was called, it was called hupomene, hupomene right, where he endured. He continued to endure, endure, and not empty waiting. He's enduring. He's standing the post. He's staying under pressure. When it'd be really, really easy to walk away and he'd want to, he doesn't. He stays there. That's endurance. That's the patience he's talking about. A lot of times we think about patience as, um, as like you just sit back and wait, right? You just sit back and wait, don't we? Okay, we're ability to sit around and wait for something to happen. He's not talking that. He's talking active endurance, not passive waiting. Active endurance. Okay. Now, I love that he mentions that first because he's going to need that endurance. He's going to need that patience because what is he going to go through? Uh, tribulations or troubles, uh, needs and distresses, right? And so here he is, an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's also an ambassador of Jesus Christ. He's also a co-worker of Jesus Christ, right? Okay, and he, and he follows endurance or patience describing why he needed to endure. Uh, because of troubles, because of tribulations, because of needs, because of distresses, because of everyday general struggles and trials of life. Who doesn't need that? Right? We all do. We all need to endure, right? Absolutely, because we go through general struggles and trials of life. What does John tell us? John 16 says, Jesus says, there's going to be what in the world? Trouble, but take heart. I've what? I've overcome the world, but there is going to be trouble. It doesn't say like, oh, well, you know, if there is. No, it's when there is. It's when there is, okay? Now, Paul was often stressed. He was often under pressure. Okay, and often needy, he was often in distress. And so he needed to have absolute active endurance. And he was walking that way. He also went through all kinds of sufferings that were directly inflicted by men. As we read, what? Beatings, right? There were beatings. There were 
imprisonments. There were seven of them. There were riots. In other words, that's disorder, okay, uh, that, were, that would cause confusion. He went through riots, okay, and so he continues in his resume and he shares about the sufferings of what? Of things that were inflicted by other people to him. And so does he need patience? Does he need endurance as he's walking through that? Absolutely, okay. Remember, he, he had stripes. That was a whipping that was done to him, right? And all the frequent times that he was in jail, the imprisonment. And so, and so a lot of violence from angry mobs who want to come and get him because he's telling them that Jesus is it. Jesus is the Savior. And they're like, no. So they would go after him, okay? Nowadays, it's not so much violence that they come after uh, us, but it's the mockery or the amused contempt of the crowd against believers, that you must stand fast, right? It's more of the mockery. It's more of the, you know, the contempt kind of thing and that you then stand fast. So he had general um, trials, everyday trials. He had inflictions from other people. So he needed patience here and endurance. He needed endurance here. And then he also continued in his resume describing his self-inflicted hardships. Not that he did this on purpose, but it was self-inflicted, okay? Hard work, right? Sleepless nights and hunger. Hard work, sleepless nights and hunger, okay? No one made him work so hard, okay? No one was keeping him up sleepless nights. Nobody was withholding food so often from him, okay? These were true trials, okay? But, but Paul chose that willingly, willingly as a co-worker with Jesus Christ, right? You're going to suffer sometimes, right? Will he always provide for you? Will he always, are you always standing in his grace? Absolutely. But he chose those things willingly as a co-worker with Jesus Christ. He was not complaining about those things. This is just another reason why he needed patience, why he needed that fruit of the spirit, the patience, right? To be able to endure, to be able to endure. So, so Paul knew that he needed endurance and he knew many things in his life would seek to draw him to that patience, to that endurance, okay? The general trials of life, the inflictions from other people on him, the sufferings uh, brought on actually by himself, just being a co-worker with Jesus Christ. So not every trial, ladies, is the same, right? That's the point of all this. Not every trial is the same. You're going to go through all kinds of different trials, just like Paul, all different kinds. Okay, but but they all make you need endurance, right? They all make you need endurance to stand the post, to stay when you want to walk away. And you're going to stay there. You're going to endure. You're going to endure. Jesus, as he walked through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, okay, he spent many a night in prayer. Many, many a night in prayer, okay? But he never, ever, when you read the Gospels, his life was never led in a frenzy, right? He spent many a night in prayer, but he didn't, like, then go through life, you know, in a frenzy, okay, about his life. In fact, John 17, 4 says this. Jesus is talking. I glorified you on the earth. He's talking to his father. I glorified you on the earth having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Okay, so he endured. He endured. He had trials. He had sufferings inflicted on him. He had, he had self-infliction on him as well because he you know, prayed all night. He fasted. He did all different kinds of things which would affect your body, okay? And, but he said, no, nope. I've done the things that you have given me to do. He endured. He had patience and he endured. Now, Paul goes on to say, well, okay, so all of this is happening in my resume, but I want to tell you how, you know, the resources that I took advantage of uh, in triumphing over the adversity. And so what does he say? He says, by purity, uh, by understanding, by patience, or by long suffering, by enduring, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, genuine love by um, speaking the truth, by the power of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, 
okay, by the armor of righteousness on my right hand and on my left hand, okay, in the New King James Version. So he is expounding on the resources that he took advantage of in triumphing over all the adversity. It's not like he was hanging on for his life. That's not how we walk through adversity, ladies, right? That's not what we do, right? We we have resources that we take advantage of, okay? So he honestly listed his trials, right? And now he is honestly listing the fruit of the spirit and the power of God in his life. So Paul had trials that I just read in 2 Corinthians 6, 4, and 5, which what? Let's go over. Troubles, hardships, distresses, beatings, prisons, riots, hard work, sleepless nights, hunger. Okay? He had all of those. However, and, and, you know, quite frankly, he had those in greater measure than most people, right? He had those in greater measure than most people. However, he also had the blessings then of verses 6 and 7 in greater measure than most people, right? What did he have? He had purity, understanding, patience, kindness, in the Holy Spirit, in love, truthful speech, power of God, weapons of righteousness in my right and left hand. Right? So he had those as well. So, so the idea is, yes, he went through all of this, but it was met with way greater strength. Same with us. Same with us. He that's in me is greater than he that's in the world. Right? The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives where? In me. In me. Absolutely. Okay? And so the idea of... Uh, on the right hand and on the left hand is that he's holding offensive and defensive weapons, right? He's holding, Paul's holding offensive weapons and he's holding defensive weapons. And it probably has in mind with like, like advancing and then being attacked. Advancing and then being attacked. Isn't that how life works? Isn't that how life works? You're advancing and then you're being attacked, okay? And so we know the fruit of the spirit, right? Particularly the shield of faith, right? Is there be attacking you? What happens? You got your shield of faith on, right? You got your shield of faith on. And the fiery darts are coming and everything is like <coughs> down, right? But how do you advance? How do you go forward? What's your offensive weapon? The sword of the spirit, right? The sword of the spirit, okay? So the shield and the sword, right? The left arm and uh, the right arm. And so we have the doctrine of truth. We have the word of God, the word of God. We have the power of God. We have the armor of God, Ephesians 6 tells us, right? It's his armor. We have the armor of God as, a, as the armor to protect us on all sides, on all sides, all sides, 360, right? Everywhere and on all occasions. How great is that? Isn't that just amazing? We have everything we need, right? Everything we need to walk through this life to be victorious, no matter the hardships. I love that Paul brought up all this stuff because you, otherwise you'd be like, oh, well, yeah, you know, he's the apostle, he's worker, Jesus. The, this, the, I mean, really, come on. Of course he's good. No, no, no. He went through way more than you and I probably ever will do. And then he says, uh, look, um, in concluding his resume that we read, Paul is listing then references. He's listing references describing both what the world thought of him and what God thought of him. What the world thought of him and that what God thought of him, okay? So the world, and that included the Corinthian Christians, okay? That included the Corinthian Christians because this is what they thought of him. They describe Paul with words like dishonor, evil report, deceiver, unknown, dying, beaten, sorrowful, poor, having nothing. That's how they described him. But in his reference, in his resume, he also shares how God described Paul, right? Honor, good report. You see all the opposites? Good report, true, well-known. Behold, he lives, not killed, 
always rejoicing, making many rich, possessing all things. Do you see the difference? Do you see the difference? Because it said by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as beaten and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing all things. You've got the world's look on him and you've got God's look on him. So this is the way the world would describe Paul and this is the way God would describe Paul. Okay, so which was this, which description was true? Which description was true? The world's or God's? Well, we go back to 2 Corinthians 4.18, which is the key verse in 2 Corinthians, right? Which says, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, right? But on what is unseen, okay? Since what is seen is what? Temporary, excellent, but what is unseen is what? Eternal, is eternal. Excellent, Michelle. Give that girl like monster donuts, candy, something. Excellent. All right. Now, so which description was true? Okay, the world or God's? Okay, well, I just gave you the answer. Okay, because according to the things that are seen, according to things that are seen, the world's estimate was correct. The world's estimation was correct. According to things that are seen. According to the things which are not seen, God's estimation is correct. Are you following me? Are you following me? Because this is what is seen. Oh, but this is what he's accomplishing. This is what's unseen, right? This is what's unseen, okay? Now, my question to you is, which estimation is more important to you? Don't answer out loud because we know the right answer, but I want you to do some dwelling, some reflection. Which estimation is more important to you? The world's estimation, the seen, or God's estimation, the unseen, the unseen. Which one is more important to you? Now, we know the only right answer, right, is the unseen, right, the, is the unseen. So, so, so what do we do then? What do we do then? Well, we are to go with Jesus outside the camp, outside the camp, bearing his reproach and offering him the sacrifice of praise, okay? And so the fruit of our lives then, counting all things as joy because the sovereign God has it all under control. That's a paraphrase from Hebrews 13, 13 through 15. What do we do? What do we do? Well, we're to go outside the camp. Okay, bearing his reproach and offering him the sacrifice of praise. Sacrifice of praise. The fruit of our lives, counting all things as joy because our sovereign God has it all under control. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Then we need to walk in that. He has it all under control. We are heirs. We are heirs of God. We are joint heirs with Jesus Christ, okay? We belong to one. We belong to one. We belong to Jesus Christ. We live for one. We live before an audience of one. It's Jesus Christ. Our passion is to what? Is to commend ourselves as his faithful servants, as his faithful servants, enduring. We're going to endure. We're his faithful servants until we see him face to face, no matter the cost, no matter the cost, allowing our lives to exhibit the high calling of being his ambassador. That's how we're to live. That's God's estimation in us. And so then we need to reflect, how are we doing in that? How are we doing in that? Are there any changes that I need to make? Are there any changes you need to make? Are there new attitudes I need to develop? You need to develop. Any new disciplines? Am I having my non-negotiable face-to-face time with him every morning? Are there any new disciplines that I absolutely need to start? Um, my uh, oldest daughter uh, came to me yesterday and she said, Mom, you know, uh, I realize that um, I need to have a new discipline in my life and I'm missing out. And so I'm, I've written this down. I'm going to be doing this. And 
before I look at my phone or social media or anything, I'm going to be with Jesus. I'm going to open up my devotion book and my Bible and not do it on my phone. Because if you notice, even if you don't get notifications, they'll pop up. And where does your mind go then? Right? It, it, in other words, you're not all there for him. You're not all there. He's all there for you, right? You're missing out. You're missing out. And she said, you know what? I used to do that, Mom, and I need to so do that. And so I'm, I'm and I thought, thank you, Lord. Absolutely. Right? Look at the book and write in it, right? And that, she says, yeah, I used to do on my phone or read your devotional or this. And then I was like, well, I'm good. But it's like, I was checking it off. I'm like, well, if you're just doing it to check it off, Mm-hmm. right? Not much power in that, not much endurance in that, correct? So so maybe there's a new discipline. Maybe there's a, a new discipline that you need um, to get back into the habit of, or you need to add, right? Because we are his ambassadors, whether you want to be or not, right? We are saved and headed towards heaven. This is in our home, and we are his ambassadors. We do his agenda, right? We are doing his agenda. So we need to do what? We need to seize the day, right? You have grace for now, grace for now, grace for now, grace for now. We need to seize the day while it's yet day. Seize the day while it's yet day. That's what he tells us to do, right? Today's a day of salvation. Today's a day of salvation. Now, let's look at verses 11 through uh, 13, because I'm going to reread these because Paul is speaking to the Corinthians here as a father, okay? And he has a desire for reconciliation. And so let's look at um, 6, uh, 11 through 13. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. And in the New King James, it says, oh, Corinthians. And open wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange, I speak as to my children. Open wide your hearts also. Open wide your hearts also. In the New King James, I like to read that as I'm studying. It says, oh, Corinthians. And I love that it says that. Because he's he's, he's making a pointed appeal to them. And he loves them. He spent a long time laying down principles. And now he's like, I want you to just love me as I'm loving you. I'm making this pointed appeal to you as Corinthian Christians. And you can sense the depth and the passion in his heart as he cries out, oh, Corinthians, oh, Corinthians. So Paul is practicing what he preached to the church of Ephesus in Ephesians 4.15, which he always says to speak the truth in what? In love. To speak truth in love. To speak truth in love. He genuinely loved the Corinthians. Genuinely loved them. And he loved them with an open heart. And he would also want to speak openly to them. And that's what he's been doing. But the Corinthian Christians were playing victim. They were playing victim before Paul. Now remember... Out of godly necessity, Paul needed to be firm with them back in 2 Corinthians 4 and in 1. If you remember, they got all bent out of shape because he had to change his plans, right? And he couldn't come at the exact same time that he had said that he was going to come and stop by, right? Before Macedonia, he came after Macedonia. And that just blew them away, right? They're like, oh, sure, you know, I'm going to come. And so he had to speak to them. Uh, firmly. It was a godly necessity to speak to him them firmly on previous occasions. Okay, now, they're probably claimed to be restricted by what? By the quote-unquote hurt that Paul caused them. Okay, they're holding on to that. The hurt that Paul caused them, okay? And so it's something like, well, you know, we'd love to reconcile with you, Paul. And we'd love to reconcile with you, Paul. But the pain that you caused us restricts us from you, Paul. Ever been there? We just can't get over it. We just can't get over it. 
Well, when relationships get rough, when relationships get rough, you become unhappy, you become disillusioned, you become disappointed. And the first thing that you usually do is you quit communicating. When relationships become rough and you're unhappy, disillusioned, or disappointed, the first thing you usually do is you quit communicating. And that's what they do. The second thing that you usually do is you withhold affection. And that's what they do. See, it's the way that we punish, making sure the person knows that he or she has failed us. That's what they're doing now. I want to let you know, Paul, you failed us. You failed us. See, this is what the Corinthian Christians did to Paul. But here's the good point. Paul did not react in kind. He did not react back that way, right? We're just supposed to act rightly before God, right? We're not responsible for anyone's reactions. And he did not react to that. He did re not react in kind. Paul's conscience was clear. He wanted to talk to them as a father does to children. He wanted, you know, to have open communication. He wanted to have open love, okay? He wasn't the one withdrawing. They were. And he kept going after them, just like God always initiates the relationship, right? He, he went after them, and their wrong behavior couldn't quell his love for them. You know why? Because his love was God's love through him. His, his love was agape love. His love was unconditional love. His love wasn't based on their actions, wasn't based on their behavior. His love was based on his love. To love just because you love. And so it didn't quell his love towards them, okay? Because it was absolutely agape love flowing in and through Paul. Unconditional love. I know that you can identify with this if you have children, right? Doesn't matter the age. Doesn't matter if they're tiny. Doesn't matter if they're in their 20s, 30s. It doesn't matter, right? If you have children, because you unconditionally love them. You agape love them. You want to talk to them as a father or mother talks to a child, and you want to have that open relationship. You didn't want to have any restraint. Paul's behavior was not the cause of the restraint that was going on. He would not own the blame. He wasn't to blame. They wanted to offset the blame on him, right? Oh, I can't possibly. We're too hurt. We can't reconcile. Look what you did to us. Paul wasn't going to own that blame. He wasn't going to own the blame, okay? Paul cannot compromise for the sake of their affections or their communication. You don't compromise, right? You're walking in truth, you're walking in grace, you're walking uprightly, okay? You don't, you don't compromise for just to receive their affection back. You don't compromise, okay? Or their communication back, okay? That would encourage what? That would encourage their wrong behavior, correct? And so he continued to share, healthy relationships are not manipulated. Healthy relationships are not manipulated. They are based on honesty. They're based on integrity. So Paul must bring them face to face, face to face as children with what they must do. And so that's what he says to them. He's like, I'm speaking to you as a father, right? Look, you're restricted in our relationship because of your own affections, he tells them. It's your own affections. It's your own love. Right? It wasn't the fact that I don't love you enough, Paul is telling them, it, it, you know, because they're claiming, you know, that they're victims because he doesn't love them enough. Okay. It was that they loved too much. But what did they love? There's the question. What did they love too much? Okay. They loved the world too much. They loved the world and the things of the world too much, right? You're going to find, we're going to find that in the following verses that Paul is sharing with us. They love themselves too much. It wasn't that they were loving Paul. They were loving the world. 
They were loving what the world can give them. And they were loving themselves. And they refused to really deal with their selfish, worldly attitudes toward Paul. There lies the problem. So Paul goes, look, I, I, we want you to be open. We're open with you. We want you to be open with us. Paul wants to, them to have the same self-searching honesty as he has. He wants that in the Corinthian Christians so they can have a relationship. I am displaying this to you. I want this to be caught by you and displayed back to me. Okay, because they had to do that so they could be reconciled. There's no reconciliation unless that happens, right? Reconciliation takes two. Forgiveness takes one. Reconciliation takes two. Reconciliation means that you are at enmity with one another, enemies, and then you're brought back to one, back together. Reconciliation, okay? So they had to have an open heart and look inside and realize what selfish jerks they were being, right? So that they could be reconciled. So the rift between the Corinthian Christians and Paul could be healed. Ever been there? Ever been there? Absolutely. But it was in the hands of the Corinthian Christians to do it. Because Paul was already doing it. He was always going after them. Always going after them. They also had to be open. So Paul tells them, look, you know what you got to do? Guys, you got to narrow your love. You can't love the world. You can't be loving yourself. You got to narrow your love. Let's look at verses 14 through 18. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Says the Lord Almighty. Right? Exclamation point. Paul says, look at you got to narrow your life. You can't be loving all the world stuff and just add a little bit of Jesus. You can't be doing that. You can't be loving yourself first and then adding a little bit of Jesus. That's not how it works. Look, you can't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Okay, Paul's speaking to the overly broad affection of the Corinthian Christians. Okay, they they adjoin themselves to unbelievers. Okay, and this pre, excuse me, this prevented reconciliation with Paul. Because quite frankly, they liked that style. They liked that style. They were very attracted to that style of unbelievers. He, now, the idea of do not be unequally yoked together. Remember a yoke. Remember what a yoke is, okay? It's a like a wooden instrument that went around the necks of two animals, okay? And then they were, they were harnessing them together to do tasks, okay? That's what a yoke is. So he says, look at, don't be unequally yoked together. And that's based on Deuteronomy 22.10. Because God was saying, look at, I'm prohibiting yoking together of two different animals. And he specifically mentions um, what shouldn't be joined. He said, look at, the, the ox and the donkey should not be yoked together. Okay. And, and so they, they cannot do the task together. Okay. In other words, they have different sizes. They have different temperaments. They have different strengths. They cannot do the job well together because they're different. They're different animals. It speaks of joining two things that should not be joined. In fact, he even talked about, um, in Deuteronomy 2, he talks about two kinds of seed. He talks about two kinds of seed in the vineyard. And he says, not only the crops you plant, but also the fruit of the vineyard will be defiled because you've got two different kinds of seeds. Not only the crops you plant, 
but the whole vineyard will be defiled because you've yoked those together. Now, in what ways had the Corinthian Christians, okay, become unequally yoked together with believers? Well, one way was they were marrying, okay, an unbeliever, which is a very common way, even nowadays, that this principle um, is applied, okay? However, Paul means way, way much, way more than this, way more than just marrying an unbeliever. It really applies to the environment, the environment where we let the world influence our thinking. Right? What were the Corinthian Christians in love with? The world and themselves. And so what happens is the environment then that they're living in, okay, they let the world influence their thinking more than God, more than God, okay? And so when we're being conformed to this world and are not being transformed by the renewing of our mind, Romans 12, 2, right? What happens is, is we join together with unbelievers in an ungodly way. Did you hear me? Do you understand that? Okay. Okay. This speaks especially to what? To influence. To influence. The issue of influence. Okay. Paul is not suggesting that believers never associate with unbelievers. That's not at all in the context. Okay. He makes it very clear if you go back to 1 Corinthians 5 and read 9 through 13. 1 Corinthians 5. 9 through 13. Because the principle here is we're supposed to be in the world, right? But not what? But not of the world, right? Okay, let me give you a little quick example. Like a ship is to be in the water, but water shouldn't be in the ship, right? Okay, this is a little example. The ship needs to be in the water because that's what a ship's made for but there shouldn't be water in the ship. See, that's what he's talking about. We need to be in the world, but not of the world, but not of the world, okay? So if the world is influencing us, it's clear we're unequally yoked together with unbelievers. You become who you focus on. You know that, right? You become who you focus on. Okay, this unequal yoke then, this, this ungodly influence, it can come through anything. The books you read. What books are you reading? What do you watch on Netflix? What do you have online? Who are you hanging out with in social media? What are you posting on social media? What movies are you watching? What television shows are you still watching? I mean, I remember my, my sister Mary, this is years ago, probably 10 or more now, where she came to retreat up at Fort, and uh, she came to me and she just started weeping. She goes, Margot, you know what? I don't even know what you said, but the Holy Spirit so, so convicted me that she was watching some soap opera. I don't even know what the name of it was. And she said, Margot, it is, it is absolutely trash. It is absolutely, they're living this way, and they're doing this with this, and that with this, and this, this, and they're trying to go to this, they're in bed with this person. And she said, and meanwhile, I'm, I, I'm, I'm taping and I'm watching. She said, that influences me. I said, you bet it does. It influences you to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. See, it, it's the influence. It's the influence, okay? We're supposed to be in the world, not of the world. Okay, and so that unequal yoke or that ungodly influence can come through anything. Books, movies, shows, magazines, online, even through worldly Christian friends. Oh, well, they're crazy, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, most believers are way far too indiscriminate about the things they allow to influence their minds and their lives. Let me repeat that. 
most believers are far too indiscriminate about the things they allow to influence their minds and their lives. What's that old saying? Garbage in, garbage out. You have to do something with it, ladies, when it comes in here. You have to do something with it. See, we all like to believe that we can be around ungodly things as much as we want, and we are so strong that we're just going to ward off that influence. That is a lie from the pit. Because 1 Corinthians tells us that bad company corrupts what? Good morals. You've seen it in your kids. Your kids were great in high school, weren't they? When they went away to college, what happened? What happened? Maybe they got a bad friend. Maybe they got a friend that, you know, this, 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 right, right? It doesn't matter if it's a Christian school or not. All of a sudden it says this, and then they go with this group and everything. What happens? What, what, what are you doing? You ever do that? What are you doing? Do not be deceived, 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says. Evil company corrupts good habits. Bad company corrupts good morals. It needs to come to the simple question, back to Romans 12 too, are we being conformed to this world or are we being transformed by the renewing of your mind? You only live two ways. There's only two ways to live. Either you're living in the word, God's word, and it is conforming you to the likeness of his son, or you're living in the world and it's squeezing you into its mold. You only live two ways. You're either living in the word, God's word, enough for life and godliness right here, God's word. And it's conforming you to the likeness of his son. Or you're living in the world like the Corinthian Christians and it's squeezing you into its mold. You can't have both. You can't have both. See, the Corinthian Christians thought like worldly people. They didn't think like godly people. Or Paul wouldn't have to be going, guys, guys, I love you. Turn. Look, remember what they thought? And then what God thought? And this is what they thought, the scene? And this is what God thought? He's like, no, they, they, they thought like worldly people. They didn't think like godly people. And they gained this way of looking at life or at least they stayed in this lifestyle because of the associations that they had made. Because of the associations that they had made. And they were ungodly associations. They loved to still do their old tradition of all the gods, small g, all the idols, all the gods. They loved to keep those traditions up. Sexual immorality was rampant in the church. In the church, they stayed in this behavior because why? Because of their ungodly associations. And Paul tells them, look, you need to break those. You need to break those yokes of fellowship with the ungodly. You cannot be yoked with that and walk up right now. You can't. You can't. He says what? What fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? Right? He's like, you Corinthian Christians, you're, you're too loving and too affectionate in the sense that you're accepting of them. You're accepting of them and to allow lawlessness with righteousness, to accept darkness with light, right? And to admit Belial along with Christ. Belial means Satan, right? Belial was a borrowed term in the Hebrew, meaning worthlessness, meaning wickedness. And right here, He's using it as the word Satan, Belial. The term is only used in this place in the New Testament. Only here. Only place Belial is used is right here in the New Testament. It's used many times in the Old Testament um, to express men notoriously wicked, notoriously scandalous. He's like, look, what does fellowship, what does fellowship, what does communion, what has light with darkness. What fellowship, what communion has light with darkness? None. None. By using, by, I, I love how he used the term communion in the new uh, King James Version. 
in, indicates that he really means influence. He means influence more than presence. He means the influence of that. He says, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? What agreement does it have? Apparently, the Corinthian Christians still struggled with idolatry, as I just talked about. They like to like have their traditional little gods, okay? And in 1 Corinthians chapters 8 through 10, you can read about that. They still did that. Their association with idols influenced their thinking, making it more and more and more worldly, not more and more godly, making it more worldly. What idols do you have? Doesn't it have to be a little, you know, made by hands, a little gold statue? Anything that you put ahead of Jesus Christ is your idol. You know that, right? Anything that you put ahead of Jesus Christ is your idol. They couldn't give up tradition. They wanted tradition. He says, look at you are the temple of the living God. You are the temple of the living God, okay? Now, back in 1 Corinthians 6, he wrote about you, how our body is the temple of the living God, right? Individual bodies. Here he's talking about the body of Christ as the body is the temple of the living God, okay? He's referring to the church as the temple of God, okay? And because temples are holy places, they're holy places, they should be protected against such things that are going to bring, defile it, that are going to defile that holy place. We need to protect our hearts. We need to protect our minds as holy places before the Lord. We need to protect that. Don't, we don't want to fill our minds with junk. We don't want to fill our minds with junk. We don't want to pollute it. We don't want to pollute this temple of the Holy Spirit. We said it's so easy to pollute it is even like reading about everyone else's sin and how it's glamorized. How it's okay and how it's cool and it's glamorized and it's in magazines, it's on TV, it's online, right? And once again, we become who we focus on. We're the temple. The body of Christ is the temple of God. Our bodies are the temple. That's where the Holy Spirit lives, in and through us. And because Ezekiel 37, 26 and 27 tells us God is in the midst of his temple. What do you say at the end here? I will dwell in them and walk among them. I'm your God. You're my people. This is a good, good thing. Isaiah 52, Isaiah 52, 11 tells us how we should make the temple a holy place. What should you do? It says, come out from among them. Be separate. Be holy. You don't want anything to do with that. Light has nothing to do with darkness. You don't want anything to do with that. Come out. Do not touch what is unclean. I have great plans for you. I have my best plans for you. The promise, I will receive you, God says. I will receive you, reminds us. This is not only separation from evil. It's not only separation from evil, but also separation unto God. I will receive you. Separation from evil, and it's separation unto God. We're holy unto him. So it's not just a question of trying to empty your heart and your life and everything of all this yucky stuff and the worldly desire. Quite frankly, that's an awful impossibility. You can't do that. That's trying. That's trying. That's trying. That's trying. It's rather opening your heart up to know the love of Jesus Christ that we learned about back in these chapters. And when you fall so in love with Jesus, These things pale in comparison to loving Jesus. The one who reconciled me back to God. Took the sin, who knew no sin, to become a sin for me. The sin of the whole world, past, present, and future. So that I could be reconciled, to be made right to not be enemies anymore with God through Jesus Christ, his Lord. 
when you fall in love with him, those who are forgiven much, oh, they love it. And you don't want to do anything that is going to displease him. You don't want to associate with what's going to displease him. Paul quotes Jeremiah 31 9 to show the benefit of separating from worldly influence and to have more of an intimate relationship with God. He says, I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters. I'll be a father to you. I'm a good, good father. Best father you've ever had. And you're going to be my daughter. And you're going to be my daughter. There's always, always, always a glorious promise for those who are willing to separate themselves from the world's influences for the sake of godliness. Always. Always, always, always. You guys, the evil one would come and say, oh, you're never going to be fun anymore. You're going to do this, you're not doing this, it's okay. Those are all lies. Every is the father alive. So when you hear those little whispers, immediately tell them to shut up because they're all lies. He wants to keep you right where you're at and miss out on all these amazing promises that God has for you. To walk uprightly with him in godliness, to be separate, to be holy, to be aliens in this world, to be his ambassador. Such honor to represent the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Always a glorious promise for those of us who are willing to separate ourselves from the world's influence for the sake of godliness. And as Paul is quoting these passages, these Old Testament passages, he isn't necessarily quoting them word for word. I want you to know that in the Hebrew, but he usually paraphrases them, which I love because it's like, you know, they've become his, right? He's not changing the definition of them or anything or the meaning it's just like they've become his right and he says look at come out come out come out from among them and be separate and be separate and this call deals with having too much affection for the world drawing too much to the world drawing too much to the flesh You know, when I was studying this, I remembered the parable of the soils. Remember the seeds, the soils? And I remembered that one of the seeds that failed, remember he sowed the seeds, right? And it fell on the ground, fell on the good ground, fell on this, fell on this, right? One of the seeds that failed in the parable of the soils had ground that was too fertile. And it would grow everything. Are you following me? What I'm sharing with you is we can have too much affection, right? We, we, we can really love too much thinking that we can just add the love of God without renouncing Satan in the world. Or just add a little bit of Jesus to this and you know, I'll be okay in school. See, too fertile. You're going to grow everything. And who's telling you to come out and be separate? The Lord God Almighty. The Lord God Almighty, okay? Almighty, almighty, Greek word, pantocrator, pantocrator, almighty, almighty. It means the one who has his hand on everything. The one who has his hand on everything. Almighty, almighty. And in all the New Testament, except for the book of Revelation, this is the only place it's used. God Almighty, the one who has his hand on everything. And Paul wants us to understand that it's absolutely sovereign God of heaven who offers us adoption, adoption as his children, as we separate unto him. What a glorious place to be, right? The call to purity, the call to separation unto God flows from what? Reconciliation that was mentioned, right? In 2 Corinthians 5 that we read, that we studied. A man, a woman cannot accept reconciliation with God and continue to live a lifestyle of sin. I didn't say you weren't going to sin occasionally. I didn't say that. I said you cannot continue to live 
a lifestyle of sin. Because the renunciation of sin is involved in the acceptance of reconciliation. Think about the Corinthian Christians with Paul, right? They were holding the gripes, they were saying this, they were holding, right? And, and they needed to have this renunciation, right, of sin, and then the acceptance of reconciliation. Both of those go hand in hand. Paul never ever assumes in this chapter, if you're reading this, okay, that we may accept one benefit of redemption. Oh, this is great. This benefit of redemption. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Okay. And then reject another. Remember I said you don't just get, get out of hell card free? Get out of hell free card? Right? One doesn't go with the other, right? You cannot take pardon for your sins and refuse sanctification. You cannot take pardon. Everybody wants pardon for their sins. Who doesn't want that? Pardon for my sins. Oh, that's so great. Somebody else paid for them. Oh, it's great, great, great. Pardon for my sins. But you can't take pardon for your sins and then refuse sanctification, becoming more and more like him and less like your future itself, doing the next right thing. See, we are to go. We are to take the message. We are to urge. We are to um, have people reconcile to God. But we are not to partner with them. We are not to partner with them. God shares his glory with no one. And where does God live? In us. He lives in us. He is in us. And so he does not want us to compromise. Yes, he wants us to go. Yes, he wants us to share. Yes, he wants unbelievers. Absolutely. Yes, 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 yes. But we're not to partner with them. We're not to be yoked with them because he knows what's going to happen. He knows what's going to happen. So if God is your father, then guess what? Invite others to visit his home. You're the temple. You're the temple. You're his home to hang around you, to come to your house, right? For you are where he dwells. Who knows? They may want to move in permanently under his authority. Right? How good is that? They may want to move in permanently under his authority and love, right? I remember, I remember a friend of mine sharing when she had come to Christ. And this is probably, I would say, almost 15, 20 years ago now. And I'll close with this. I remember this, that she would come to me and she said, Margo, I'm praying, praying, praying for my high school friends. She was not a believer in high school. She played softball. She drank a lot. She partied a lot. She flirted a lot. All kinds of guys and this, this, and now they're married and this, this, and then the girls would all want to get together and they would go out as high school friends and they would go to the bars and they would flirt and they pretend they're not married and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And she's a believer. And she's like, Mother, I want to be, you know, a light to them. I want, I want to keep with them, but I don't want to partner with them. I said, yeah, you don't want to be on your yoke. I said, okay, great. But you want to be a light, right? You want to be salt. She goes, yeah. I said, well, invite them to your house for coffee. Don't go there because that's all temptation and it's this and you're partnering them and this is right. But can them come to your house for coffee or meet, you know, for coffee during the day, in the morning. Brilliant, brilliant. Why did I think that? So she did. She started doing that. And then she started doing one-on-one -on -one with them. They started coming over. And then they'd hear her story. And then she'd be able to share about Jesus. She wasn't like, oh, I'm not going and doing that. Ah, you guys are all sinners. <laughs> yeah, my word, you're going to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> That's not what she did. She's like, you know what? Why don't we do coffee? I would just love to do coffee. I, I'm just not wanting to do that. I just would like to do coffee. Why don't we do coffee or do lunch? Or do, oh, okay, okay. I mean, you guys, you know, you're doing that. I, I just, I'd rather not. But I want to see you, so let's get together. And so one by one by one, they've been coming to know Jesus. Not all of them. A couple of them. But they're watching her. They're watching her. And she's not unequally yoked with them. She's not being torn and acting like that. 
She's not being tempted to flirt when she's married. So she invited them to her house or invited them to a restaurant. See, finally, what, what, when you're bound together in a yoke with someone who doesn't hold your same values and beliefs, you're so locked into that relationship that you can no longer act independently. You no longer can act independently. And eventually, they will want to go in a different direction. And you can't follow and honor God. That's what happens. That's why he tells you, look, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. We're in the world, not of it. Yes, we're supposed to be sharing with them. Yes, we're supposed to be. But you don't want to, because this is what happens. And so in chapter 7, we're going to see what Paul is saying, what to do. What to do and how to follow through. So let's end in prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing in our lives. Thank you that your word is true. Thank you that we can that we can come before you and we are reconciled to you through Jesus Christ, your son. What a cost that was. That wasn't cheap grace, God. And you want us to continue to be sanctified, to become more and more like you, and less and less like the world. Not that we're not shining to them, not that we're not wanting to be in the world, not that we're not going and sharing, not that we're not taking the message, not that we're not urging to be reconciled to Christ, God, but, but not partnering with them. And so, Jesus, give us that deep, deep love for you, that we want to please you, and not love the world stuff, or love ourselves more, but that we love you, because we know you, and we know your promises, and we know that you stand on your promises. And we know that you have your best plan for us right now as we are standing in your place. But by grace, by grace. And so, God, I'm asking that what we have read today, what we have studied today, what we have dwelled in the word about, Lord God, that you would just continue to uh, nurture us with it, to bang it around in us, Lord, that there are disciplines that need to start or or that we need to have changes, or that that we want to have you on the throne and not us. We don't want to be like the Corinthian Christian. We're so grateful that you're such a good, good father. That you you, you chose us before the foundation of the world, and and you reconciled us back to you in relationship. That we can walk through this life as ambassadors and co-workers with you. So don't let us compromise, Jesus. Even this week, God, may we be so aware of areas that we might be loving the world and that we would just repent and give that over to you. Lord, we love you to pieces. 